Good afternoon. It's Thursday, the 24th of September. I'm Erin Viner, and this is IBA News, broadcasting from Jerusalem. We open with a catastrophe in Mina, Saudi Arabia, where at least 717 observant Muslims have been killed and at least 800 others injured in a stampede during the annual Hajj pilgrimage today. Saudi authorities say that the crush happened in a large valley about five kilometers from the holy city of Mecca that has been the site of similar disasters in previous years. Mina is where the pilgrims carry out a symbolic stoning of the devil by throwing pebbles against three stone walls. It also houses more than 160,000 tents where the pilgrims spend the night. The Kingdom's Civil Defense De De Directorate initially reported that at least 450 other pilgrims were hurt during the stampede that occurred on Street 204. Amateur video shared on social media captured scenes of horror with hundreds of bodies lying amid crushed wheelchairs and water bottles. Survivors huddled at the top of roadside stalls as rescue workers combed through the wreckage. An estimated two million people are taking part in this year's pilgrimage, which began on Tuesday. This has been the deadliest disaster since 2006, when more than 360 people were killed in a similar stampede in the same area, and about 244 others in another stampede two years earlier. Today's incident comes less than two weeks after a giant construction crane came crashing down on the Grand Mosque in Mecca, which is the focal point of the Hajj, killing 111 people and injuring around 400 others. Well, the tragedy occurred as Muslims around the world, including here in Israel, celebrate the Eid al-Adha annual holiday, which honors, according to Islamic tradition, the willingness of Ibrahim to sacrifice his son Ishmael as an act of absolute submission to God. Worshippers celebrate by holding festive dinners and dividing the meat of sacrificed animals between family members, with one-third given to other relatives and friends, with the remaining portion donated to the impoverished. After more than a month of deliberation and controversy, Public Security Minister Gilad Erdan has retracted his recommendation to appoint former IDF Brigadier General Gal Hirsch as the nation's next commissioner of police. Erdan blamed the unlimited vetting process for taking far too long as the reason for his decision, which he said he undertook with a heavy heart. Erdogan is believed to have come to the conclusion after it became clear that Attorney General Yudha Weinstein was not inclined to defend the appointment. Erdogan condemned what he said was the character assassination and defamation endured by Hirsch since becoming the designate and stressed that he no longer wanted to subject the candidate nor his family to further agony, which he said he didn't think was likely to end any time in the near future. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also spoke out about the issue, saying that he too still believes that the former IDF general is the right man for the job and that the state system of appointments definitely requires re-examination. While speaking outside of his home in Rosh Ha'ain this morning, Hirsch told reporters that he respects the public security minister's decision and was informed that it came because his appointment would not be approved in the foreseeable future, which compelled Erdogan to pursue another candidate. Hirsch added that even though he personally never sought the position, he had viewed the opportunity to become the next chief of police as a great honor and mission. He added that the entire saga taught him a disappointing lesson about the mean spirit of our society and national strength, as well as the government's ability to implement its policy. The Prime Minister convened his security cabinet today to vote on the implementation of tougher measures against those convicted of throwing rocks and firebombs while enabling police to more effectively disperse riots. The main changes include the easing of opening fire, introduction of fines on parents of minors caught involved in the violence, as well as the establishing of minimum sentences. Meanwhile, the government lifted restrictions for Palestinian Muslims to visit Jerusalem's old city for the Eid al-Adha holiday by permitting all males aged 45 and up, as well as all women over the age of 30, access to the noble sanctuary both today and tomorrow. Jews and members of other religions have been barred from visiting the area. 
And in Hebron, hundreds of Palestinians attended the funeral for a 19-year-old woman who died after being shot by soldiers yesterday. According to the IDF, troops only opened fire after the female knife-wielding terrorist ignored orders to halt as well as warning shots, although a Palestinian witness has refuted that account. Clashes between mourners and security services broke out following the funeral. And in another incident last night, soldiers in the Jordan Valley foiled an attempt by a Palestinian to hurl a bomb at them. Troops from the Kfir Brigade nabbed the suspect before he was able to activate the explosive. Elsewhere, four firebombs were hurled at the community of Sagot, north of Jerusalem. There were no injuries or damage caused. Jerusalem itself saw the Yom Kippur Holy Day pass relatively quietly. A firebomb hit the balcony of a home in Abu Tor in Jerusalem, and police cars were pelted with rocks in Piskat Ze'ev. The defense establishment reports that since the Rosh Hashanah New Year last week, 137 suspects have been arrested for involvement in violence, including 61 minors. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas is warning that a new intifada could erupt if violence at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem does not stop and peace talks with Israel are not resumed. Abbas made the remarks in Paris following meetings with French President Francois Hollande ahead of next week's opening of the United Nations General Assembly. France is trying to launch an international contact group at the UN that would be made up of members of the Security Council, Arab states and the European Union who would be tasked with efforts to revive the peace process. Abbas described the situation in Jerusalem as extremely dangerous and close to spiraling out of control into an intifada that he says the Palestinians do not want. Hollande urged calm on all sides and called for the maintenance of the status quo on the Temple Mount. The expected raising of the Palestinian flag outside the UN General Assembly opening is seen as a diplomatic victory for Ramallah, although bar -Ilan University Arab Affairs expert Professor Menachem Klein told IBA's Ario Sullivan that the act carries little more than symbolic significance. President Abbas, a uh, big achievement uh, during his decade plus, decade plus uh, term in, in office, is that uh, the UN General Assembly accepted Palestine as a non-member uh, state. And now, symbolically, the flag will be next to all nations, all member flags. This is a very symbolic, but on the ground he's losing. He's losing on the ground for the Israeli settlements, and he cannot show any dramatic achievement on the ground politically also in the political arena, not on, on the ground uh, political arena, there is no peace process, there is no prospect for resuming the peace process, there is no hope of achieving any agreement, and there is, uh, there is no agreement on the preconditions that will bring to the negotiations. So on, Abbas lost almost everything in his uh, strategy uh, to, or did not gain anything in his strategy to rely exclusively on the political track. Only this symbolic achievement that the Palestinian flag and then the Palestinians can imagine as they are independent, but they are far, far from being an independent state. Mahmoud Abbas is threatening to renege on all the previous uh, signed deals with Israel. What's the price we'd have to pay for that? What is clear for me is that Abbas faces a moment of truth take a very serious decision, strategic decision. He must take it because all the tracks are closed, no political track. On the ground, he's losing more and more territory for the Israeli settlement expansion. He has no political backing from Europe. Europe is interested in other issues. United States is, is not planning to mediate between Israel and Palestine. So he has here in September the flag as a symbolic achievement. It, he can say, I, may, I achieved this, and then the next will be for my successor. The rest is, I leave it, the rest for my successor. He can, he may, I don't know. Nobody knows, but he faces a moment of truth and tough decision. The question is whether he is this type of a leader that can take such a decision or say, sorry, I cannot make it. Is he more concerned about his legacy or about really making changes on the ground? So the 
crucial point is the substance of the, such a decision is mm -hmm. what does it mean on the ground? Okay. Okay, and then, then it's not only that he will state the end of Oslo, he must set down what the practical outcomes of such a decision are. Now we can say, okay, the PA is over, now we will leave everything to municipalities. But this is the, the dream of Israel. Okay, so he surrounded to, to, to Israel, he does not want that. Besides, there is the self-interest of the VIPs. Mm -hmm. They don't want to lose the, the, the yeah. income and the, the status and the car, the Audi cars and, 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 and so on. So he's threatening with an unloaded gun. Exactly. And then Israel made it very clear to him that if he resigns or dissolves the PA and the chaos prevails, Israel reoccupies, immediately reoccupies the West Bank. That's the decision. This is the, the, this is the plan. So I don't know if he is ready to face it. The official memorial ceremony for the 2,673 soldiers who fell during the 1973 Yom Kippur War was held at the National Mount Herzl Military Cemetery this morning. President Reuven Rivlin spoke at the service, saying that the war was an open wound as he urged society to learn a lesson not of complacence, but rather to keep a careful eye on the nation's leaders every day. Defense Minister Moshe Yalon and Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Gadi Eisenkot also attended the ceremony, marking 42 years since the Egyptian and Syrian armies launched a surprise attack against the Jewish state. The Russian Defense Ministry today announced that Moscow's Navy is poised to conduct exercises in the eastern Mediterranean Sea within the next few weeks. This development comes as a new satellite pictures reveal the continued escalating Russian military presence in Syria. We get more in this report from IBA's Dennis Zinn. The satellite pictures taken close to Latakia in northern Syria, released by the Jane's Defense Review, shows 28 advanced Russian fighter jets parked on a runway at the Basel al-Assad International Airport. These include 12 Su-24 and 12 Su-25 ground attack planes. Jane's analysts say that the pictures also show preparations for housing troops and heavy equipment, possibly tanks. However, the Russian military buildup does not seem to worry Washington. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said he believes that Russia does not pose a threat to U.S. interests in the area. And there are certain kinds of aircraft there uh, which, depending on uh, what the long-term decision is by Russia about its presence, could raise some questions. But for the moment, for the moment, it is the judgment of our military and most experts that the level and type represents basically force protection uh, a level of protection for their uh, deployment to an air base, uh, given the fact that it is in an area of conflict. However, Kerry said that in the long term, Moscow's support of the Assad regime may be problematic. If they are there to fight ISIL and only ISIL, uh, even, as they, uh, even as they provide continued support as they have previously to Assad, but with a view to getting to a legitimate negotiation, and to cooperating with people against ISIL, that's one possibility. And it's one, uh, you know, it's something that uh, we will obviously talk about in New York in the next few days. But if they are there to shore up Assad and to simply stand there in a way that uh, provides Assad with continued sense that he doesn't have to negotiate, then I think it's a problem for Syria. And it's a problem for everybody who wants to bring an end uh, to this conflict, which has gone on for too long now. The IDF is obviously closely monitoring the situation. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held urgent talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin earlier this week to discuss the possible threats posed to Israel by the Russian military buildup in the area. IDF sources today said a meeting has been scheduled with Russian military commanders next week to prevent any misunderstandings between the two military forces. Dennis Zinn, IBA News. Turning now to the migrant crisis, and despite deep divisions, European Union leaders today managed to agree on boosting border controls aimed at stemming the human tide flowing into their nations. 
They also agreed to send 1 billion euros to international agencies that help refugees at camps near to their home nations. The leaders also said that task forces of European experts sent to help register and screen migrants in so-called hotspots must be fully operational in Greece, Italy and possibly also Bulgaria by November. The move is intended to quickly identify those eligible to receive refugee status for relocation in Europe while filtering out economic migrants who are unlikely to qualify for asylum. The leaders also pledged to increase support to Lebanon, Turkey and Jordan to help those countries cope with the millions fleeing the fighting in Syria. Around half a million people have so far journeyed to Europe this year alone in search of sanctuary or jobs. As the numbers have risen, many nations have been forced to tighten border security. And Hungary faced fierce criticism for erecting a razor wire fence along its border with Ser Serbia, as well as its nearly completed barrier with fellow EU member Croatia. At the conclusion of today's meeting, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban said that he obtained much of what he wanted, but that the leaders failed to go far enough in bolstering border protection. For the first time, I think European uh, institutions show a very important uh, approach, an innovative approach. This question is a question about uh, everyone and not only about, uh, about uh, single member states. It is clear that the greatest tide of refugees and migrants is yet to come. Therefore, we need to correct the policy of open doors and windows. Now the focus should be on the proper protection of our external borders and on external assistance to refugees and the countries in our neighborhood. In other news, International Atomic Energy Agency Director Yukia Amano has announced that environmental samples have been taken at the sensitive Parchin military site in Iran and that the UN watchdog organization has achieved significant progress in its investigation of Tehran's past activities. The IAEA is due to provide an assessment of the possible military dimensions of the rogue republic's nuclear program by the end of the year. That report is seen as a vital confidence-building aspect of the landmark deal six major powers reached with Iran in July that placed restrictions on its atomic energy activities in exchange for the lifting of sanctions. Amano said that he visited a building at the Parchin site earlier this week while accompanied by the head of his agency's Department of Safeguards, which is charged with carrying out the inspections. This was the first time that the agency had visited the location. We entered a building which the agency had previously only been able to observe using satellite imagery. Inside the building, we saw indications of recent renovation work. There was no equipment in the building. The implementation of the roadmap has reached an important phase. Verification activities at the parking site were conducted in a manner consistent with our standard safeguards practice. All the information obtained is now being assessed by the agency. However, much work remains in the weeks ahead. Full implementation of the roadmap is essential to clarify all outstanding past and present issues regarding Iran's nuclear program. In response to the statement from Amano, White House officials say these positive signs are the result of the tough international sanctions placed on Tehran. For a long time, Iran had resisted cooperating with any sort of inspections that the IAEA wanted to do. And as a result of the international pressure that uh, built up over time, principally because of the tough economic sanctions that the United States put in place and got the rest of the international community to, to go along with, uh, we now see indications that Iran is cooperating with IAEA inspections. And the statement from uh, the IAEA today uh, indicates that authentication by the agency of the samples was achieved through the use of an established verification process. The process was carried out under our responsibility, meaning the IAEA's responsibility and monitoring. Uh, this certainly uh, disproves the claims of our critics who suggested that uh, Iran would be conducting self-inspections. 
A senior Iranian nuclear official is, however, calling the IAEA statement false and insisting that no inspectors have been allowed to either enter Parchi nor take samples, which he claimed were collected by the Iranians themselves. Well, Pope Francis is receiving a warm welcome on his first ever visit to the United States. During the first full day of his journey, he was cheered by jubilant crowds across Washington, D.C. We get more about the historic mission in this report from CNN. He arrived at the White House in his now iconic and understated Fiat hatchback, but received an outsized official welcome for a world leader. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. The president, vice president, secretary of state, and 11,000 invited guests forming his first rapt American audience. I have hoped to listen to and share many of the hopes and dreams of the American people. The pope, mild-mannered but politically deft, addressed issues right at the center of the U.S. political debate. Religious freedom, immigration. As the son of an immigrant family. I'm happy to be a guest in this country, which was largely built by such families. And later, climate change. It seems clear to me also that climate change is a problem we can no longer be left to a future generation. After a final blessing for the American people, God bless America. He met privately with the president in the Oval Office. I noticed all of you are much better behaved than usual. <laughs> Exchanging his fiat for the Pope Mobile, Pope Francis had his first chance to connect with his fans and supporters, though under the tightest security. The distance from the crowd bridged for a moment when security personnel carried children right up to him for his blessing. Later at St. Matthew's Cathedral in Washington, he met with U.S. bishops, the Pope addressing the Catholic Church's sex abuse scandal, saying he supports their commitment to healing the victims. The Pope's final stop today, Catholic University where he performed the first canonization of a saint on U.S. soil. Unipara Serra, a 19th century Spanish missionary in California. In financial news, the shekel today put in a mixed performance against all major foreign currencies, while share prices on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange were down across the board. Here's a look at the afternoon numbers. The IBA weather team tells us to expect clear to partly cloudy skies tomorrow, accompanied by a slight drop in temperatures, although it will still remain unseasonably warm for this time of year. Here's the forecast to home and abroad over the next 24 hours. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. I'll be back tomorrow, same time, same channel. Hope to see you then. I'm Aaron Viner, wishing you a wonderful evening, and shalom from Jerusalem.